You know, standing here in the ashes of 2020, it's easy to feel powerless about the state of the world and anxious and uncertain about our future. You know, we feel climate change accelerating. We see inequality spiralling and political polarisation. I don't need to tell you. It's tearing societies apart and it's making it much harder to solve all those problems. Some people will tell us now is not the time. Times are too tough right now to tackle those wicked problems. They'll tell us that those systemic issues, they can't be addressed. Well, I think the system that got us into this mess, it can't be relied on to get us out of it. That's the bad news, okay? The good news is there are people all over the world who are shaping a future that we can actually look forward to. Clearly, I'm an optimist, right? So, so much so that I wrote a book about positive visions of the future, Utopias in 2020. I did it because I want you to feel the optimism that I feel. Having met people all over the world who are resetting the system to build a future that actually includes us. Now, they're not dictating one prescriptive set of solutions. They're not advocating for one ideology over another. What they're doing is creating processes that include more of us, processes that give us all a say in the future. And we need them right now, more than ever, because if there's one thing that unites people all over the world right now, it's the fact that the majority of people around the world are disillusioned with the status of democracy. The University of Cambridge's Centre for the Future of Democracy have been surveying countless peoples for decades, and the vast majority of people in democracies around the world are dissatisfied with the condition of democracy. This number gets worse every year. And if democracy was standing for election right now, it might be writing a concession speech. You know, I'm one of those crazy people that's trying to work inside politics, trying to change it from the inside out. And sometimes I even feel like your vote, your voice in a protest, your name on a petition, does any of it really have an impact? We've been talking more and more about those undemocratic forces that sort of distort our public discourse. The media moguls, the political factions, the marginal seats and the minor parties, the big donors. But there's another fundamental disconnect that we need to address. And that's the fact that our elected representatives rarely resemble us. Meet Andrew. Andrew is the typical Australian politician. And he is older, richer and whiter than the typical Australian. Amy, by the way. Uh, Now, look, nothing against Andrew. I I actually like some of these Andrews. These are the nine Andrews that represent you in Australian Federal Parliament right now, okay? You know what, this is a tough gig, and some of these guys are pretty good guys, but I think what we're asking of him is totally unrealistic. You see, Andrew comes from a narrow range of experience, right? Andrew is much more likely to have worked in law than to have worked in childcare. Andrew is infinitely more likely to have been a landlord than a tenant. And Andrew, he probably came of age during the 80s or 90s, rather than during the hottest years on record, feeling the impacts of climate change since childhood. Of course, we've got to address the structural reasons why that is. That's a whole talk in itself, right? But I just think for a moment about the ideas that go unmentioned in parliamentary debates and in cabinet meetings, just because of a lack of diversity in the room. Think about the useful perspectives on work and the economy we might actually get if you had more freelancers and food delivery writers, retail casuals, designers, nurses, you name it, at that decision-making table, not just lawyers and management consultants. Imagine the ideas we could draw from the world with more languages to draw from, more cultural traditions to reference. Imagine the creativity you might get from the several generations after Andrew, the people who've grown up in a radically changing world, creatively adapting to it. You know what? We do need to elect more diverse representatives, absolutely. But time is short, and we've got to take some shortcuts to get there right away. Now, remember those people I told you about, the ones that are giving me hope? 
they're actually modeling ways that we can update democracy and politics for the 21st century to make it more like the world that we live in, so that it's immersive, it's continuous, it's a multiplayer experience. And there's so much of the world that we can learn from. We could learn from Estonia, a place where once your petition gets a certain number of names on the, on the signature, it actually becomes a bill before parliament. It means citizens set the agenda. We could learn from Iceland, where they actually make it fun to participate in politics. They employ game designers to do this. You know, we could learn from Brazil. In parts of Brazil, local communities allocate budgets closer to the ground, more fairly, um, so that the money goes where it's needed. Or we could learn from Taiwan, where they use some of the techniques of the startup world to help local communities, citizens, actually solve social problems and tackle some of the impacts of those disruptive industries that are changing our world of work. All of these processes, unlike politics as usual, empower us to be active citizens in the time between elections. They draw on all of our experiences, on all of our creativity, and they really place us in the middle of the story, in the middle of creating the solutions for the future we want. And because there's more minds in the room, you're more likely to get an outcome that's more mindful of more people. When the stakes are really high, though, we can go a step further, and we can empower our fellow citizens to solve the biggest challenges of our time. In France, action on climate had stalled. The Yellow Vest movement arose in response to some really unfair environmental policies. And in response, to break the impasse, President Macron launched the Citizens' Convention on Climate. This was 150 citizens aged 16 to 80. They were selected at random by text message, and they were a mini public, representative of France itself by age, gender, and location, and education too. They were paid for their time so that everyone could actually afford to participate. And even though they came to the process with a range of different views, they had access to the facts, to experts. They had structures for constructive debate. And they found themselves galvanized by the facts. This group of citizens actually charted a path forward for France's climate policy. They put forward 149 policy recommendations, big ones. They talked about taking away the subsidies that underwrite our make-take-waste fossil fuel economy. They talked about creating incentives to retrofit buildings and rebuild cities for sustainability. They talked about the green jobs that would result. And you know what? President Macron accepted all but three of those recommendations, and he promised to take them to French Parliament in one big omnibus bill. More than that, they did something even bolder. They actually recommended changing the French Constitution, one of the most influential documents in world history, so that the very first article guarantees the preservation of the environment, of biodiversity, and the fight against climate change. The UK held their own climate convention in 2020. In September, 108 citizen decision makers handed down their final report. Likewise, they had a decisive result. 79% of them demanded a green recovery from the COVID crisis. 79% of them demanded a green recovery from the COVID crisis. They called for taxes on frequent flyers, banning of SUVs. They called for incentives for more biodiversity in farming. And they called for a shift to wholesale funding of public transport. You know, that's the difference between citizen-powered decision-making, right? Citizens working together are, are bolder and more courageous than our political headlines or our polls might suggest. And this is a process that could cut across the political spectrum. Boris and Macron, they're not political radicals. And yet, a climate assembly or convention is also one of the demands of the global Extinction Rebellion movement. This is a process that gets more minds in the room to solve the problem. And it's a process that could give our elected Andrews more courage to take decisive action, to lead, with social license to really make change. I know how useful this is because I'm an elected leader at a local level. And 
you know, there's not just a gap in who steps forward to represent us, but also in who steps forward when leaders try to make change. We typically only hear from a tiny minority of people, people who know how the system works and want it to keep working for them, people who are passionate advocates for the status quo and who tend to be older, richer and whiter than their neighbours. What about everyone else? What about the 99% of people we don't hear from? What are they willing to contribute to build a future they can be excited about? What are their priorities? I know how useful this can be because we had a citizens convention at the city of Sydney last year, and our citizens challenged us to go beyond sustainability, to actually create a regenerative city, one that cleans the air and water and that gives back more than it takes. Politics, as usual, has failed us on climate action. Nowhere more so than in Australia. You know, the vast majority of Australians want immediate action on climate change. And yet, for the most part, our politicians have failed to deliver it. Could this be it? Could now be the time? Could a citizens' convention on climate be the catalyst for change that we need? Maybe the leadership we've been waiting for comes from the bottom up. Maybe the ideas just haven't been in the room. TEDx Sydney, fellow citizens, this is my big ask of you, of you, of all of you. What will you do? What will we do together to make a citizens' convention on climate a reality, here and now? Thank you.